I'd like to talk to you today about the human brain, which is what we do research on at the University of California. Just think about this problem for a second. Here is a lump of flesh, about three pounds, which you can hold in the palm of your hand, but it can contemplate the vastness of interstellar space. It can contemplate the meaning of infinity, ask questions about the meaning of its own existence, about the nature of God. And this is truly the most amazing thing in the world. It's the greatest mystery confronting human beings. How does this all come about? Well, the brain, as you know, is made up of neurons. Looking at neurons here, there are 100 billion neurons in the adult human brain. And each neuron makes something like 1,000 to 10,000 contacts with other neurons in the brain. And based on this, people have calculated that the number of permutations and combinations of brain activity exceeds the number of elementary particles in the universe. When I first watched that neuroscientist's talk on TED, I remember being struck by God's brilliance in designing mirror neurons the way he did. In a blog posting that I wrote right after watching it, I wrote, I think it's neat how God builds a capacity to follow into the basic fabric of our brains. Our brains innately imitate the activity of another whether we want them to or not. We can choose to follow up that imitation by mimicking the action. We still have free will. But regardless, at some subconscious level, we follow. We still follow. We're built to follow God. We are made to follow an ultimate other. I'm preaching it instead of reading it. The one who made and is making the ultimate movements. I wonder if Jesus, the one through whom all things were made, knew about this when he said, follow me. There's a burgeoning new field in design called biomimicry. Don't know if you've come across it. A few of you have, I know. Basically, it's the idea that you follow the lead of great designs that are already present in nature in designing new products. So a wind turbine rotor design company followed the design of a humpbacked whale's fin designing a rotor with bumps on it and found an increase in efficiency in terms of garnering wind energy. Others looked at lotus leaves in order to determine how to create self-cleaning surfaces. Others looked at beetle shells to better determine how to get moisture out of the air, out of fog. This idea of biomimicry made me wonder what the neuron has to teach us. What do neurons have to teach us about life, about life's design? And I figured, listening to that video again, since there are as many permutations and combinations of brain activity as there are a number of elementary particles in the universe, this should be a fairly easy task. So, I talked with two New Hope Church scientists. Um, one is Jackie Wamstaker, who is... Oh, I can't say that anymore because you're married and her husband's just nodding her head. Okay, memory check. You did the wedding just a while ago. It was a redo of the wedding, so I didn't do the first wedding. So I can be faulted for forgetting Carlo's last name is... That. <laughs> Jackie, who's with Carlo, was one of the scientists. She uh, does research on neurons at the University of Calgary. And the other is a younger researcher, my son Thomas, who's doing his fourth year of a BSc degree at USC as well. My first question to Jackie was, what do neurons teach us about who God is and how he works? And this is how she responded. Pastor John, these are very difficult questions to answer. Actually, I'm afraid that my, it's bad when the scientist you're going to for the answers is starts off that way. Actually, I'm afraid that my interpretation is more similar to that, you, to that you came up with during your wound healing discussion, the sermon of a couple weeks ago. Rather than telling me about who God is or the nature of God or how he works, I think that the way neurons work tell us a way for us to respond to God and or the way God means for us to live fully. As soon as I read her opening response, I emailed her back and wrote that these two goals of 
knowing God and knowing ourselves are not mutually exclusive, of course. John Calvin, a theologian, said that in order to know ourselves, we need to know God. You can't know who you are apart from knowing God, and you can't really fully know who God is apart from knowing how He made you, who you are. And St. Ignatius, I quoted back to her, said, the glory of God is a human being fully alive. Jackie then went on with her attempt to answer the question, and I'll give you a few excerpts here. Each and every neuron is formed with communication in mind. Their job is to listen and pass on what they've heard. What do they find out about the world? Some neurons are highly specialized, feel, touch, or pain. Some neurons smell, or taste, or see, or hear. Most of our neurons exist wanting to listen to other neurons. They grow big, long, dendrite branches to seek out chemical connections that are good or get rid of ones that are bad. And what do they do with this information? Well, as far as we know, their main purpose is to pass it on. And then she put rights in brackets, our Christian calling as well. Through being passed on, maybe a few hundred times, back and forth, around and around the different circuits of our brains, these miraculous, miraculously, these messages become our physical senses, our ability to run, jump, sing, eat, or sleep, our emotion, imagination, conscience, our self-awareness, or our awareness of others, all the things that make life rich and human. Through singing an electric song, Neurons are built to pass on information with precision, faithfulness, and reliability. But each neuron also has the capacity to integrate and change the messages it receives. And fascinatingly, when neurons experience information under certain conditions or special kinds of information, they learn what they've heard, and they remember it, using this to change the communication over time. This is both an elegant and complex process that we don't fully understand. And then she went on to explain a few other things, but also more precisely and applicable to our question this morning, what this fact, these facts of neurons mean for us in our relationship with God. God made us this way to be like neurons, she says, and maybe this sounds crude, but we too are who God intended when we exhibit input and output. We are fully designed to listen to His Word, His world, and His people, and to receive His gifts of grace and love with our dendrites. We are meant to actively seek out these connections, discerning the good from the bad, Subsequently, we are blessed to be a blessing. We are meant to spread the good news or teach what we know. Importantly, God gave us a true gift in learning and memory. This makes our lives richer and adds to the combination we pass on in some way. In this way, from what we know about neurons, it is nearly impossible to ascribe our most human of capacities, for example, empathy or love, to a single neuron, or even a type of neuron. And this is important. It is only with a community of neurons in this beautiful, complex, interconnected communication that we can develop something this wonderful. This, perhaps, reflects how God intends community as a solution for people to be greater than the, th than the sum of its individuals. And when I finished reading it and rereading it and getting the depth of something she sees and knows intimately, it made me wonder, God, will your love, your empathy, come to full fruition only in a world and when a world full of human beings collectively give full expression to it? Only as everybody made by the hand of God inputs and outputs freely and fully and organically the way we're meant to, will that happen? Only when we listen 
and love with all of our hearts and all of our souls and all of our minds.